song that we just sang was about surrender. 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 Surrender to the Holy Spirit and all of his ways and all of his wishes about trust and going into the deep places, not sure about what's going to come next, but you just want God, you just want to follow him wherever he goes, I just want to follow God wherever he goes. I just want to put everything into you, God. Because I'm going where you're going. We're following where you lead, Holy Spirit. We're following you. Jesus, Jesus people, Jesus people, chasing after him, surrendering fully to God, finding him in the deepest places, is there a Jesus revolution? Jesus revolution. Just tell him you want him tonight. Jesus, just tell him that you want him tonight. We want you
bless your name, oh God. We bless your name, oh God. Yeah. 
everybody doing now? And the Spirit of the Lord is with us. And we're just going to continue to soak in His presence and love on the Lord. He's changing us even now as we sit in His presence. When we open our hearts to Him, He's changing us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to share a couple of scriptures tonight. We're going to receive our offering. And then we have, uh, I think Michael's going, to, Michael's going to sing for us, sing a song. And Bless us with that, and then we have uh, Milad's going to come up. Uh, Milad and Soph are going to share, uh, sing a couple songs for us as well. And then uh, Winky's Winky's here in the house right now, so give give Winky a hand. <laughs> Maybe somebody could turn the fan off just for a little while. But uh, this is going to continue. We got people that are coming in from. Uh, a lot of different places all over the United States. This thing's just going to keep growing in, in number. And uh, so we're really excited about that. You're going to meet a lot of new people this week in the next 10 days. Um, before I share that scripture, I'd just like to thank our friends, uh, James and Kim Mosby of Oak Ridge Ministries for coming all the way from Washington State and give, that, give our awesome friends a hand. Um, James is going to be... Uh, He's going to be uh, coming up here and sharing some things with us over sometime during the next uh, week and a half here that we're going to be here. How many are going to actually be in that run tomorrow? Raise your hand. Come on, is that all we're going <laughs> to? Some of you look like you're really in shape, you know. I thought you'd probably <laughs> be ready for that. But we had a couple of our fire starters did a, uh, they swam Otter Tail Lake the long way two weeks ago on a Saturday. That was pretty impressive. And uh, one of them, John, where'd John go? Oh, he's, all right, he's standing, he's right in the back there, standing there. He, he did the last two miles with one arm. How about that? And, uh, and then Heather, Heather Rosenthal, um, I think she did it a, twice just for the fun of it or something, I don't know. But uh, man, don't you just love the the presence of the Lord? I was thinking about Exodus chapter 15, talking about the the song of Moses and the you know just celebrating the awesome victories that God has. Um, you know, our God He loves to conquer, and He wants us to love to conquer, and. Um, is thinking about laying down our lives. I mean, some of these songs that we're singing tonight, they're so intense, you know. And uh, they're, they're really intense if we believe what we're singing. Hello? Yeah, that blood, you know. That blood, they overcame by the, by the blood of the Lamb, the Word says, by the word of their testimony. And they... Love not their lives even unto death, it says. And I was thinking about Peter, you know, and he was just, yeah, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'm ready right now. I'm ready to lay it down right now. He wasn't even close. He wasn't even close to laying it down. And so sometimes I think our, our songs are prayers of, and, and a prophetic word of what we will become. But we, we have to, uh, we have to gird ourselves up and, and allow the Lord to strengthen us so that we think about that. We think about what it really would be like to lay our lives down, and then would we really do that? The kingdom of God is about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to see uh, 
God's going to change things. He's changing things. He goes into our, our hearts. And uh, this really doesn't have a lot to do with the, with the offering that we're going to receive. I just want to ask you to just re re prepare your offering. Try to hear just a couple of things I'm going to say. It actually does have quite a bit to do with... Uh, the offering does have quite a bit to do with what I'm saying. I mean, wouldn't that be true? Wouldn't that be true if Jesus Christ is Lord? I mean, he's, is he Lord of just some of the things in our lives, or is he Lord of everything in our lives? He certainly needs, uh, we, we need to um, honor him and reverence him and, uh, with, our, with our giving because it's how, we, it's how we show him that we love him. It's how we show him that we trust him with our very lives. We're not afraid. Uh, we're not afraid in our hearts for what's going to come on the planet. We're not afraid about what the future holds because we know that he's holding us in the palm of his hand. We either believe that or we don't, people. Do you believe that he's holding you in the palm of his hand? That he's orchestrating your life as you move with him? He is, as you move with him, he's moving with, with us. He's moving with you. And uh, I just love that celebration. A lot of the songs that we sing are just so, you know, it's a, they're about revolution, they're about uh, reformation, they're about revival, and they're about changing. Uh, you know, God wants to make us fighters, doesn't he? He wants us to make us. He wants to make us fighters. He wants to make us mighty men. And uh, I'm just going to pass by the song of Moses here. I just wanted to share this tonight because. I was just reading the scripture in Malachi, uh, in chapter four, a little bit. It's one of the songs, or, or excuse me, one of the, one of the um, passages of scripture that the Lord gave us when we started the, the ministry fire starters back in '98. Um, wow, just a powerful passage. He's talking about here in uh, the about. Elijah the prophet, he's going to send him, send Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the children, the hearts of the children of the fathers. Well, how does he do that? How does God change a heart? Um, for God to change a heart, he has to go into the heart, doesn't he? He goes into your heart. That's how he changes your heart. Do you ever think about that? He goes right in. So we need to invite him in. Because once he's in, then he can change our heart. Yes! Don't you love that? He's coming in. I just want to warn you this week. He's coming in. He's coming in. Praise the Lord. It says here, uh, I just love this, verse 16. Uh, there's a bunch of people, they, they loved the Lord, they feared the Lord. It says that uh, they that feared the Lord, they spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. In other words, his ear was inclined towards them, because he heard what they were talking about. He was right there, moving with them, listening to their voices, wasn't he? And they were talking about him. They were talking about how much they loved him. They were talking about how much they feared him. They spoke often one to another, and the Lord heard it. And then it says that there was a book of remembrance. God wrote a book of remembrance. It was written before him for them that feared the Lord 
and that thought continually upon his name. This is just a lifestyle of thinking upon his name. Just living it every day, just thinking about Jesus all the time. So powerful. And then he says, And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that does not serve God. And that's really the time where there's a distinction coming. It's a, there's a, there's a, this prophet, this Elijah the prophet, will make a determination, a dividing, a defining line between those that love him, those that don't, those, those that serve him, and those that do not. Praise the Lord. Because perilous times are coming. It says there's a day coming and it's, it shall burn like an oven. And all the proud and all that they that do wickedly, they shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them as burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. This there shall not leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear his name, here's it is, to you that fear his name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. He shall arise with healing in his wings. Well, how's he gonna do that? He's gonna come right in. He's going to come right in. But they that fear the Lord, the Son of Righteousness, shall arise with healing in His wings. And remember the law of Moses. Remember the commandments. Remember the commands of the Lord. Remember the Ten Commandments. Remember the, the law that He has written on your heart, the law that He has written in your mind. Never forget it. Continually remember it. Con continually rehearse it. Continually walk in it. Fear the Lord that much. Reverence the Lord that much. That you would never want to do anything to sin against God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, Father, we just thank you for... We thank you for uh, this time that we have together. Lord, we are... We are um, we're beside ourselves. There's something leaping on the inside of us. There's something vibrating on the inside. There's something that wants more of you, even though we already have you, we know that you are in us, but there's something more, and we know it. We know it. We can feel it. We just pray that right now you just receive this uh, offering that we bring. Just pray that you just receive it with... Uh, Pray that it's just a, it's a sweet smelling savor. Just a, it becomes a fragrance to you as we give it, because we give it not because we. Oh boy, here comes the offering plate again. No, we give it because we have a cheerful, loving heart, and we're not afraid of what tomorrow holds. And we're going to prove it. We're going to show him with our actions that we really mean it. We just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's bring our offering. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Michael. Let she wind blow through the stem of blowing out the dust within now come and breathe your breath upon me Because I've been born 
again. And Holy Spirit, I surrender. Just take me where you want to go and plant me by your living water and plant me deep so I can go and Jesus you're the one who sets my spirit free use me use me Lord glorify your holy name through me and separate us from this world Lord Sanctify my life for you and daily change me to your image and help me bear good fruit and every day we're drawing closer as trials come they test my faith but when all is said and done Lord, you know it's been worth the way and jesus you're the one that sets my spirit free now use me lord and glorify your holy name through me How's everybody doing? Thanks for coming. It's good to have you guys here. I gotta get behind the light so I can see everybody. We've all been working, working to get this place ready for you. So I'm just glad to, glad to see all the faces and people close by and people from far off. It's awesome. So I just, Welcome to Otter Tail, I want to tell you that. How many have never been to Otter Tail before? All right, yeah. <laughs> well, welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, we gotta, we're going to have an awesome time. You guys excited? Do you feel it? <clears throat> I encourage everybody just to really soak it in, you know, just it's easy to it's easy to get caught up in whatever's happening, but just take some time to reflect and to let God, you know, like Pete was sharing, you know, let God in and let him do a work. Sometimes you just got to turn everything off and sit with him for a while, let him do some things inside, you know. It means you got to turn your mind down and focus in on him, you know. I think that's what Mark was talking about a little bit. Some things God just come and does, but sometimes he waits for an open door. You know what I mean? He wants to come and do crazy stuff in your life, but he's waiting for you to open that door just a little bit, slow the motor down, and just hang out and wait for him. Amen? Hallelujah. Man, I'm tired already. 
Can I pray? And We're grateful to have Winky here. And Michael, Mr. Terrell. There he is over there. <laughs> and your beautiful wife. She got a haircut. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord, we are a grateful people. God, we're honored that you would come. Sorry, I got to tell you one more thing before. I was talking with a gentleman the other day about about just creating a space. You know, at home we, you know, you make a you make a home and you enjoy life there. You create create a patio and all of a sudden you're hanging out out there. Here, what we've done is we've created a place where God can come and where we can come and gather together, be together in one place, and that he's welcome. So that's part of what's, you know, part of the burden that's on the body here is that we want to create a space. Maybe there's a, hopefully there's a little more liberty than, than other places, and, and it's grateful I was just looking around at the people that would come you know, the people that would come. Everybody here, you know, you would all come and take time to come. Um, but the real goal is that he would come. Uh, you know, obviously he's already here, but we just want to keep cultivating and nurturing a place where he's welcome and desired above all, and that he can come and do his thing. Amen. So God, we're just here. We are here. We open our heart to you this evening. This whole week, God, we ask that you come and, and uh, change us from the inside out. Come and enter my heart and soften me. Make me into a new man, God. And we ask that everybody that travels here and comes here, God, we ask that you move on them. We ask that you bless every person that came and that's coming. I ask you, pour your love out on them, God. Let this place, let this floor, let this room be a place of encounter for everybody that would come in, God, that they'd encounter you. Lord, maybe there's people that, that have heard so many great things about your attributes and about your personality, God, but I, my desire and my prayer is that when they come here, they come into an encounter and an experience and a relationship with you. Not about the tellings of God, but about the knowings of God. So, Father, would you just come in a mighty way? Come in a mighty way and change us, God. Change this landscape. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Is it me? I guess it's me. I don't want to speak before the pastor. I'm going to talk real quick for a minute and tell you about the song if you want to kill that reverb off my vocals. How's everyone doing? Yeah. Did you hear them? Could you hear them? How's everybody doing? Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Praise God. Well, um, I am Milad. I'm rolling solo with Sophie tonight. The band's not here. We are Blood Type G. We're going to do a couple songs. I want to tell you about this first song. It's called Desperation. And it's actually kind of similar to what you were talking about, Pete. It's about really experiencing God in a deeper level. And sometimes you have to be desperate for God. Sometimes you have to be so empty of yourself that he can come in, like you were saying, and take over. And so this song was written in a time where I was desperate because I had realized that my mistakes had not only hurt my relationship with God, but ultimately had hurt others and so I was desperate I cried out to God and he heard my prayer y'all ready
Up in this world of material, if you let them, they'll bury you. In superficial wealth, I've been keeping my health. Meditating, consecrating, asking myself, where did I go wrong when I lost a friend? Not just anyone, my closest friend. How did I allow this strife to settle in? I'm a lover to the end. No promises endure to the end. In times when I needed you, you were distant. Now I'm moving on, nothing left in my heart to give. Never Many again. days and nights, emotional lows, spiritual heights, anguish and demise. Now I've come to realize the mistake and compromise. Like one of those guys, my flesh was meshed, my soul disguised. Walking in the flesh, they try to warn me. Make the right decision, foolish decision after stupid decision. I began to give in temptation. No promises endure to the end. In times when I needed you, you were distant. Now I'm moving on, nothing left in my heart to give. Oh no, no promises endure to the end. In times when I needed you, you were distant. Now I'm moving on, nothing left in my heart. Again and again, temptation, self-gratification, bad situation, compromise position. As a result of compromise, and now I'm living in the consequence of sin. Can I carry this burden? Is my heart is beating? I'ma cast this burden while my heart is bleeding through this pad and pen. Writing me thin, but for my friend, my closest friend, I'm a lover to the end. Love never fails, even though I've been betrayed by the ones I love the most. In the name of God, they make a boast. They drink my wine and make a toast. Break bread with ya, same bed with ya, amen with ya. Play games with ya, then break your heart. Lying to themselves, gotta search their hearts. No. I was lying to myself, but God searched my heart. Oh. If you lie to yourself, gotta search your heart. Gotta search your heart. No promises endure to the end. In times when I needed you, you were distant. Now I'm moving on, nothing left in my heart to give. No promises endure to the end. The chorus says, no promises endure to the end. The times when I needed you, you were distant. So now I'm moving on, nothing left in my heart to give. Never again. And the message behind that is people let us down. People don't keep their promises. But the Lord is faithful. You can put your faith and trust in the Lord and his promises because they they endure forever. The Lord will never fail us, never forsake us. And so the, th the theme behind the song is don't put your trust in people because we make mistakes. But if you put your trust in the Lord, he'll deal with them. He paid the price for not just you, but them also. So make sure that we forgive and we shall be forgiven. So one of the promises in the word of God is that Jesus is coming, amen? Oh, you guys need to get more excited about that. Jesus is coming, amen? Okay, I'm excited. I'm ready to go. But, uh, so this song is uh, entitled Hero. It actually was recorded originally in Berlin, Germany with my German rapping cousin. But we'll do an English verse for you instead. And 
And uh, so it's saying, better get ready. Hero is coming, but you could easily change that lyric because Jesus is my hero. You better get ready. Jesus is coming. You ready? I'm ready. Jesus is coming. Turn that up in my monitor. Come on, stand up with us. Flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood. I got one hero and his name is what? Supernatural hero. Destined for victory, defeated the enemy. He came ready, made death bloody. Yes, he won the fight. All power and might, he overcame. Fortune and fame, he puts to shame those who claim the game. Blowing up the spot, hot dynamite. And nothing can stop him, not kryptonite. He ain't no Superman, I told you, man. Said you watch me, get off the wall. Yes, yes, yo. Bring the heat, yo. To the street, yo. Supernatural is ready every day. Ready every hour. It's the last round. Rock steady, heavy power. Ready. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Whoa, are you ready for this? Better get ready. Hero is coming. Hero is coming. Better get ready. Better get ready. The sky hero is coming. Everybody needs a hero. Like, who's gonna save me? Like, who's gonna take me away from the destructive patterns that lead me to a darker place? Need someone stronger as a lion that can show me. Dream of a day, the world will flee and pass away, even summon no disarray. Hero will come down in flames and save the day. Woo, that's my breath. No, nah, but I believe it. No, nah, because I can see it. Yeah, I can hear it. Here, take it, receive it. Be prepared, it's a chance worth taking. Who's faking? If your faith don't rise, the hero is coming like a thief in the night. Ready? Are you ready for this? Hey, yeah. Rock steady. Are you ready for this? Whoa, are you ready for this? Better get ready. Hero is coming. Hero is coming. Better get ready. Better get ready. Hero is coming. Ready. Are you ready for this? Hey, yeah. Are you ready for this? Rock steady. Are you ready for this? Oh, are you ready for this? Better get ready. Jesus is coming. Better get ready. Better get ready. Look to the sky. Hero is coming. Yeah, we'll do one more. And then uh, we'll get out of here. So uh, this one is called I Go Hard. It's really simple. You got to help me with the chorus. Say, I go hard, and you repeat it. I go hard for the Lord, for the Lord. I ain't scared, I ain't scared. Give me more, give me more. Okay, let's try. I go hard for the Lord. I ain't scared. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. They got it. Okay. ready when you guys are. I go hard for the Lord. I ain't scared. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. We in a battle. Ain't never been scared. I just put all my righteousness. Yeah, Christ's death. Substitution for my filthy soul. We in a war zone. So strap up your boots and get your wool clothes. So when the gates open, doors close. So when you have the path to heaven and the way ain't Morris code. It ain't no secret that we keep into ourselves, but it's the life, death, resurrection of a born soul. His name is Jesus who left heaven just to free us. And his great ultimate freedom was given at a cost. 
For God so loved the world that he gave us his all, but it's all ain't enough for some of them sinful people that's lost. So we gotta go hard in the pain, get it straight. We ain't scared, cause for me to die is gain. Faith is what I wear. For me to live is Christ, so I live and I share this great, glorious gospel that was given to us. Hey, yeah. I go hard for the Lord. I ain't scared. Give me more. 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 I go in for my chain. I ain't scared. Give me more. Give me more. All your gospel haters better listen up. We go hard, climbing steep up, straight up, like the skyscrapers. Strapped up from the feet up, take a sip from his cup and get blood on your lip. Get that gun off your hip. If you dip and let it slip, then get it right and get a grip, like an alligator clip. Don't get caught in the rip. Take a walk on the water and don't even trip. Make the time to get it right. This one you can skip. Let him take you on a trip around the world in a whip. When your enemies surround, like the Gaza Strip with satellite surveillance and a microchip, tell me what you gonna do, abandon ship. No, we never die, so don't hold your breath. I got no reason to lie. It's a fight to the death. We overcome their might by the blood of the Lamb. Yes, we done won the fight tonight. I go hard for the Lord. I ain't scared. Give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more. I go in for my gang. I ain't scared. Give me more, give me more, give me more. I go hard for the Lord. I ain't scared. Give me more. Give me more, give me more, give me more. I go in for my king. I ain't scared. Give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more. Praise the Lord. I love you guys. Thank you so much for having me. Tomorrow. We'll give you more tomorrow. You got to come back tomorrow. This one's Paul as I'm not supposed to use it. I'd just like to thank, um, well, we have uh, Kurt and Sandy Jacobson over here from Thief River Falls. Give them a hand to pastor a church in Thief River. They're doing lots of awesome things up north. That's kind of a, a regional vision that the Lord has dropped in their hearts. They're just doing some great things. Uh, we've really enjoyed the times that we've got together coming up there. And then the women's retreat up in Baudette that Pam came up for at an awesome time. I'd also like to thank, uh, we have uh, Raju and Grace from India over here. Give them a hand. Give your friends here. New acquaintances that we met. Uh, Cal Spell, Montana. Uh, uh, Raju has been ministered overseas with Randy Clark and different, different, uh, on different uh, missions missions over there, praying for the sick, seeing amazing miracles and things like that. So, the Lord dropped something in you about a word of knowledge and things like that. Pray for anybody. You just make sure that you tell me and we'll do it. Okay? Praise God. Um, okay, there we got that one back. It's not going to work. So, it's just not going to work. And, uh, all 
also I'd just like to thank um, oh, let's see, just all the just really amazing friends, that, new friends that God has brought into our life just in the last year. Uh, I'd just like to thank Steve uh, Harrison, Steve Harrison over here from uh, Brainerd, Minnesota, right there. And uh, it's really cool. About two months ago, um, we were having a uh, just talking about revival and different things, and, and we got on the subject of the Jesus People Movement, which Mark started up talking about early. And uh, we had four men. I believe we had three men that were born again 40 years ago in that meeting. And then there was one that had, was uh, 39 years or something like that. Just amazing. We were talking about that, how God was doing something. Amazing. I think that needs to come around again, Lord. Bring it around again. You know, people talk about how the Jesus people movement came to an end. I don't really think that we could ever say that the Jesus people movement came to an end. Because God is moving powerfully. And uh, so, so let's just continue on with it and do like Mark was talking about the, the glory of the, of the latter house to be greater than the former house to so believe for it what's going to happen it says it in the Bible how many believe the Bible it says it in the Bible praise the Lord All right. And I'm going to have one of those, one of those uh, people that was born again at that time uh, and I wanted him to introduce Winky tonight um, and I'm just going to introduce Greg. Greg, can you come? Give Greg a hand, too, as he comes. Thank you, Lord. All right, thank you, Pete. Uh, I'm going to take five minutes here. In five minutes, Winky is going to be up here. But I just wanted to lay a little foundation uh, for tonight and the rest of the 10 days here. Just share a little story of how I met Winky and the effect that this man had on my life. And uh, you're, you're, I'm going to just read from these notes quite a bit to keep on track here. And uh, it'll date a winky and I a little bit, but just the way it's going to be. On June the 13th, 1973, me and a guy named Jim Kuyper left Minnesota, but we went and arrived at Discipleship Training Institute, DTI. And that day of June the 13th, I handed over... 318 bucks for the tuition for this 10-week Bible boot camp. I just sold the most dearest thing in my life. It was practically brand new when I bought it, but it was now maybe a year old. But I had this 72 Honda XL350 selling it all to get the money because I knew I was supposed to be there, right? I felt much like Elisha who took his yoke of oxen, slaughtered him, and took his plows and burned him. The mantle of the Lord had been recently come on me by the Holy Spirit, and I was off to the race. I'd been born again ten months earlier through the Bill Bright Canvas Crusade for Christ, four spiritual laws, a napkin presentation out of, at a Perkins restaurant in Minneapolis by one of the leaders of Canvas Crusade in the Twin Cities. But now, and then I went to Bill Gothard's basic youth conflicts. But all of a sudden, nine months later, I got filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. So I found myself at DTI all of a sudden with new faces, new teachers, new evangelists, and new authors. And I picked up a couple books. One, Revival Lectures by Charles Finney. Finney's lectures on systematic theology. The autobiography of Charles Finney, all hard copies. Gordon Olson on moral government, God Smuggler by Brother Lawrence, Crossing the Switchblade by David Wilkerson. Francis Schaeffer, The God Who Is There. I was 16 years old reading Schaeffer's The God Who Is There. These people were radically changing my life in this school. And then there was the books that I bought by Leonard Ravenhill. Numerous books, but then I found out, which would later realize is really the holy grail of all books concerning revival, 
because it was there that I bought and read Why Revival Tarries by Leonard Ravenhill, truly, in my opinion, the holy grail of revival books. But one premise that he brought out in that book, Ravenhill, was to not ask, where is the Lord God of Elijah? But we should be asking the question, where are the Elijahs of God? But now I was about to meet one, and I met one at DTI, and I want to say that in Winky Prattney, here was an Elijah of God that I met. And he has stood the test of time. He's mentored the Keith Greens. He's mentored the mighty, and he's mentored the young and the small. But he was there for a group of people, 50 to 75 people, that 10 weeks coming in twice as one of absolutely the premier speaker for those 10 weeks. I never met Ravenhill personally, but I did get to meet Winky at 16 years old. His major book then, even though he's written 12 by now, but not, at that point it was Youth Aflame. A discipleship manual. Winky, a man, mere barely 30 years old was already in national prominence. Billy Graham, uh, a powerful, prolific ministry, even in his 20s. But there's two things, mainly, that I learned from listening to him sitting under his ministry. One, this dude is massively serious about God. Number two, I might not be as smart as this guy, Winky, but I can know his God. And those are two things you will learn tonight in this 10 weeks. And he taught, I went and I, I took this, his teachings home with me. Uh, Winky, I don't know if you remember WPC number 110, but that was called The Nature of Sin. Or C116, How to Be Religious Without Being a Christian or 105, the law of love, or, one tw or, or C, 125, the atonement, the cross, love, justice, and mercy, or 114, trusting God's mercy. I took these home, and be, even, I wasn't out of high school yet. I had to go back home, finish high school, but that senior year was men like this that caused me to radically go into my high school and affect people, and many of you here know some of these stories in my high school but I've still got the notes at home written I would take his teachings and I've got I would listen to it and I would play it pause it and write it out play it and pause it and write it out and outline these messages in, in fine print small lettering three four and five pages breaking down these messages at, at, at that point, 17 years old in my senior year in high school. I thank God for this guy over here. And I want to say that, Winky, we want to broaden your fan base here in Minnesota. And it was an old saying we used to say, but it's still true. Winky, God is not finished with you yet, especially in Minnesota. You've served God faithfully in your generation, and you've been an inspiration. And though at times it might feel like you've been in a Bruce Willis movie and you're the last man standing, I think of you more as a Sir William Wallace, the famed Scotsman who brought a revolution to Scotland. And when it was said, it's been said that when he was asked one day, where are you going? He said, I'm going to pick a fight. And Winky, I want to say with you that we want to fight with you. And if you can pass on your baton and instill within us this 10 days, it will, it's going to happen. Amen. Teach us what you know. Teach us who you know. And we don't know, and we're not saying that we can drink from your cup or be baptized with the baptism that you've been baptized with. 
But listen, in these 10 days, please disciple us. Come on up, brother. Well, I feel humbled. Well, it's a scary thing to be introduced. You never know what people might be up to. I uh, am glad to be alive. I thought I'd bring you a little magazine article that, that says that, just in case you didn't believe it. Actually, it says, delighted to be alive, but that, that's the magazine article. So I am glad to be alive and I'm also glad to be back in this neck of the woods. I do think God isn't finished with America yet and I do think he's certainly not finished with Minneapolis and surrounding areas. Those of you who don't know me, my background is I'm a nerd. My whole ambition in life was to never travel Nerds don't travel, you understand, we just stay in one place. We have weird glasses. We have pens that leak. We have glasses that break. And we don't like people very much. So my second ambition was never to meet anybody. It was good, it saved me from immorality. I never had any girlfriends or boyfriends, so it was pretty clear. And the third thing is, I never wanted to travel. My father was a professional athlete and he traveled all the time. My dad thought nothing of getting up at six in the morning and riding for a hundred miles before breakfast. He wanted me to come and be like him. So when I was 12 years old, he made me a little bike just like his. His bike didn't have any gears. It barely had brakes. The way you stopped is you locked your legs and I was 12 years old and he took me out for my first ride. A mere 15 miles. I knew at that time I was never going to be a cyclist. Because my dad was gone all the time, I never went any more. Maximum space and time and distance I'd been from my home in a little place called Manurewa. That is spelled M-A-N-U-R-E-W-A. -E so when people read it, they go, Manurewa. What kind of town is Manurewa? Just like it sounds. And I'd never been more than 80 miles from that. So I went to high school. I have always loved science. I had a lab when I was seven years old. When I went to high school, I had a better lab than my high school did. I made plans to launch rockets against our town. I colored the local swimming pool iridescent crimson. I made my own fireworks. Came not 4th of July, but 5th of November. I still have that lab today in New Zealand. It lies behind a wall that opens up like James Bond when you hit it in a certain place. If you come to New Zealand, and I'm back down there at the time, my home country, I can show it to you. I'll have to kill you afterwards because it is secret, of course. <laughs> and to get saved when I was 17 years old, 1962, in high school, with the last three months left of high school, was a total shock to me. I am not a person with a deep religious background of any kind, so if I say anything these next few days, I'm with you, that is religious, it is a mistake. <laughs> I'm out to see three things. Two of them are simple. I want to see you crazy. Two, 
I want to see you drunk. Those two things are my ambition for this week. I want to see some boxes broken in your life. I want you to see things you never dreamed you would see. And I want you introduced to the person who will open doors in you that nobody ever dreamed existed. But for me to meet Jesus, the last three months of high school was a total shock for me. You see, I'd already planned what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a chemist, simple chemist. You can make a lot of money when you're making drugs, even if they're legal. So to get saved was a shock. See, the trouble with Jesus is that he doesn't sort of talk to you like Christian people do. Hello, what's your name? What a nice name. Listen, have you got a few minutes? I'd like to share with you a few things if you have time. If not, don't worry. Just stay on as a Satanist or whatever else you want to be. The trouble with Jesus is that he acts like he's God or something. He acts like he owns the entire universe. He acts like he is the ruler of everything. And he walks up to people who are minding their business, a nice nerd chemist, for instance, and hits you like that. You do get a choice. You could go to hell, but that is not much of a choice. And when I met him, my whole life completely changed. And I got saved the last three months of my high school time. It was so much fun that after I graduated, and I got my bursary and my scholarship for university, I had had so much fun, I decided I'd come back for another year because there was no rule in our high school that said when you graduate, you have to leave. You know, people stay sometimes, they become holdbacks for football or some sport, see? So I became a Holy Ghost holdback. And when, when I told my parents, my dad and I got saved the same night, and I said, I want to go back to high school. There's a thousand kids in our school, and I haven't seen any Christians at all. Nobody in our school ever talked about God. Nobody. Nobody rode to school on a fish-shaped bicycle. Nobody ate fish, I think. It was, wasn't even a Catholic school. It was just a good pagan school. And so I thought, there's a thousand people in our school, and the Bible says one shall chase a thousand. I'm one. There are a thousand. So I went back. The teachers said, why do you want to come back? I said, I like it. I'd just like to stay for another year. And that year we saw a tenth of the school give their lives to the Lord. And then I got addicted. This is the second part. I want to see you drunk. The only time the King James Version uses the word addicted, it is addicted to the ministry. And I fell in love with Jesus and fell in love with the people that he's in love with and a huge chunk of them were young men and women. And so this is my fifth generation of teenagers and college students. So for five decades, see, how many of you actually remember what it's like to be a teenager? None of you. How many of you remember what it was like to be in the 60s? If you put your hand up, you weren't there. <laughs> but I was so excited about what I saw the Lord do that I just stayed working with young people. The strange thing is this. If you were a teenager in those days, and it's still true today, do you know you're only that block of time for seven years? Somewhere between 12 and 20. And that is, by the way, those of you who are musicians, that is the age 
in that block of time when you hear music and you decide this is the best music that ever existed before or since, this is it. And if you f say you fell in love with, with somebody there and, and you're 12 years old and you hear a song, now the weirdest thing is, 40 years from there you can hear that song and you'll not only remember that song, you remember the name of that person. Because that little block of time is when we build the whole future of what we're going to do. And that's why some of you are ancient people. You keep going back to those previous times. But God has got a lot of stuff that he's never given to a generation before. And I think he saves the best wine to last. Now, by the way, unless some of you are concerned, I, I thought I, I heard him say he wants us drunk. Let me say it again. I want you drunk. Not with wine. I'm a chemist. I know how wine gets people drunk. It just dehydrates your blood cells, see. The Bible doesn't say, don't be drunk. It says, don't be drunk with this. It was something else. Someone else. You see, when you're drunk, drunk people are happier than normal. Have you noticed that? Hi. Hi. Ooh, my wife. This is my lovely wife. Would you stand, lovely wife? This is Faye. I thought she was giving me a bottle of wine here for a second, but it's just regular water, even scarier than wine. This is actually what I'll use to baptize some of you in front as time goes on. We need people who are happier when there is no reason why they should be. Something else about drunk people, I'm just going to have this just to remind me. Yeah, that's what it tastes like. It's all right. That's water, okay. Drunk people are smarter than they think they are. Or actually, they think they're smarter than they really are. Like, I know that. You actually don't, but you think you do. Okay. God wants to take you beyond the limits of what this thing is. We in the Western world have learned to live this way, from our minds down. But there is another way in the Bible in which we are to learn, and that is from the heart up. And whenever you see these two words appear together in Scripture, the word heart and the word mind, you will always see they're in that order. Heart, mind. But the mind, we think, and many of you have built up stuff in your mind, you're really quite brilliant now. You could even have like whole big things on the wall that tell people how brilliant you are now. I have five things in my doctorate, arts, sciences, history, communications, and youth culture. But a couple of years ago, I woke up the day after Christmas, and uh, I'm going to show you this in a second. Call my son up, you can see what he'd like. I had lost five decades of nouns. I can do this. This is what your brain looks like, not on steroids. That side was destroyed. So in one overnight thing, the day after Christmas, I lost five decades of names. Everything gone. People, places, foods, books, movies, music, no names. I knew what that was because I could see it. I didn't know what it was called anymore. I built computers. I didn't know 
anything but between a PC and a Mac, I wouldn't have been able to tell you what they were. I wouldn't even know a knife, a fork, and a spoon. If you drew them, I wouldn't be able to tell you which one was which. So it is a weird thing to lose five decades of your life in a single night. And that is basically still there. It's taken almost two years to plug back in about 90% of what was lost in that time. And one of the reasons is, is not only a lot of people prayed for me, but I got music that was done back in 1962 and re-recorded them. And I found a strange thing about the brain. This side stores all the music. This side stores the lyrics. This has the tunes. This has the words. But when you re-record a song, here's what happens. If you are, you've seen the words in front of you again, you're hearing the music, you will not only remember the song, you will remember the things connected with that song. And I think that's why God gives us this book. And in this book is a book of Psalms. And that is the largest book in the Bible. So why has God given us this book? Because this book of Psalms is not just about spiritual things and religious things. It's about war and death and love and sadness and grief and threat and fear. All of these things are in the book of Psalms. How many of you have ever read something in the Bible, let's say a simple Psalm, and some of you may have read it a whole bunch of times. And then one day, you're reading the book, and it suddenly opens up. And that same, I'm not talking about John 3.16, because everybody knows that, because they've all been to football games. But if you hit this, suddenly that will open up, and something you never dreamed before will become real to you. I think God gave this as a storage system to show us what life is like. And so in the last year and a half, maybe two years now, Though that hole is still there, I've got back about 90% of what was lost. So I'm here to talk to you about what God can do in your own heart and your mind in that order. Okay? So if you're here and God speaks to your heart, listen to this. Okay? Your heart is 5,000 times more powerful than your brain. You can read a heart 30 feet away. But when I had the MRI for that, I was like, some of you, if you've ever had an MRI, they put you in something, screams ah! like this at you for 20 minutes, like a 747 going off in your ears to get those kind of pictures. So listen to what God says to your heart. I'm giving you that to say this. It has been an exciting thing for me to be able to come back and see people again. So uh, the drunk thing, by the way, uh, have you noticed that drunk people can get punched and they don't know it? It's quite a drunk place here. <laughs> it's a changing place. You can punch a drunk, don't try it, but you can punch a person. They spit their teeth out and they come right back. God wants to take people beyond the limits of what they have and give them something, not that will hurt them, but will amplify beyond what they have ever dreamed in their lives. And this marvelous thing that we want to talk about a little bit over these next few days, the subject of revival has been one of my chief concerns and studies over the last 50 years. So I want to pass on to you what I can on some of the things that I've learned from that. Um, I have uh, my wife, you have re briefly met, this this lady with the red face now that I introduced her, uh, sitting here, you'll get to hear her a little bit this week. And I also have my awesome son, who you've seen running around and doing various things. Girls, he's still single. OK. 
Keep this in mind. If I had died in 2007, and I did, but not long enough to write a book about it, a short death, I never would have had a chance to do some things. So some of the things I want to give you these next few days, I've never seen in a book, but they're new things, at least to me, that I've never seen before, and I think you'll find them amazing. Uh, I want my son to come. This is my son, Will, or Bill. We used to call him Billy, but that was some time ago. And uh, this is a project that, that we'd started before uh, that time in career in 2007, when I died. And if the Lord had not brought me back, we never would have got it finished. So I'm going to ask uh, William to tell... This is a... We haven't actually publicly advertised this, except on a few websites here in America, but this is a study that's taken us uh, 12 years to get finished, and it takes 2,000 years of what God did in history and looks at uh, what he can do again. I've seen him do this in different countries over different times, and I am very... Uh, keen to see it happen again. Can you imagine what it's like when people remember an area? Otter tail. It sounds like something out of a Narnia movie. I have never yet heard otter tail connected with something scary around the world. You're such a nice little group of people here. And there's only a few people in this town. How could God ever do anything here? I have been to Bethlehem. It is still a hole in the wall. But people remember Bethlehem every Christmas because somebody was born there that altered everything. So I'd like to see that happen in Otter Tail. So people, this, this is this place, it's called Otter Tail. Heaven knows where it is. You could keep driving and you'll miss it. You can blink and you'll go right through the entire town. So why in the world should they have a place like this where a visitation could take place? Like stuff like that. God likes taking people who are losers, who are little, or the most unknown people and doing something quite amazing with them. So I'm going to have my son tell you a little bit. We are um, trying to... Uh, make available this book. I didn't write it, by the way. I did not write this book. It's called A Bible. Okay. I wish I did. It's a great book. It's just got a few notes. William? How are you, folks? So how many people would be coming to this particular gathering, Jesus people, with a heart specifically for revival? How many people? Okay. So a lot here. Maybe I'd say about half the people here. So I just wanted to uh, share really briefly about this uh, tool, really, that has just been made available. It uh, was first published in 2010, called the Revival Study Bible. It's in King J New King James Version. And it's a, about a 10-year uh, project. And this really came out of the Brownsville Revival over in Florida in the 90s. How many of you guys have heard of that? Um, how many of you guys went to that? A few, a handful, OK. And uh, there, despite the criticisms, which largely came from people that never visited it, um, it affected something like half a million people, from what I understand. Um, on an average night during the revival, this is over near Pensacola, Florida, uh, you might have at least 28 nations represented every night in a church that held about 3,500 people. They had to also do a video link to their chapel next door and also rent the building across the street to stream just so they could fit most of the people that came each day. They would line up at six in the morning and they would wait all day in the hot Florida sun, rain or shine, for the church doors to open at six o'clock and the services would go until midnight. There were at least 100,000 first-time salvations. There were at least 300,000 people that came back to the Lord. It was a genuine revival. It lasted for six years. 
there at that Assemblies of God Church in, in Brownsville. So this Revival Study Bible actually came out of that revival. Uh, evangelist Steve Hill, he's a friend of ours. He was in talks with Thomas Nelson, which is the largest Bible publishing company in the world. And they were saying, you know, they were in talks of how can we do a, a study Bible geared to revival? People would come up to Steve as he would share some of, some of the articles that he had personally compiled, like all of the newspaper clippings from Azusa Street at the start of the 20th century, the move of God that, that started there in California. And they said, how can we get some of the things that you're talking about? And he would basically tell them, you can't. You have to buy an entire library. That's what I did. That's what, that's what he did. So this project um, became sort of the result of all that. And uh, so we've got the study Bible. There's over 100 contributors. Um, it would include contributors like Billy Graham, Reinhard Bonnke, Heidi Baker, um, modern people. It's also got people uh, that are passed on, like uh, Dwight L. Moody, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, um, so on and so forth. And then besides the unique study chain that was done also by a friend of ours, Dr. Tamara Winslow, uh, she spent 22 years of her life putting the study chain together. It's equal in length to the original Thompson chain, uh, and it specifically deals with the revival. It's got the 50 synonyms or cognates of revival. So, so if you look at that, pretty much every page you turn to in any Bible is actually dealing in some way or another with revival. So when we're talking about revival, we're talking about a returning back to life. It could involve healing. It could involve reconciliation. Um, we're not just limiting to spiritual revival, but moral revival, natural revival. Uh, Dr. Winslow even says there's a revival of sleep. I don't, how many people are lacking in that tonight? <laughs> so there is actually a biblical revival of sleep, that God can revive your sleep, he can revive your health, he can revive your finances. Uh, obviously, there's a major revival in bringing us back to him. So I just wanted to share briefly about this, that it's, um, it's a tool that uh, we do make available. Um, through Linky's website, and if, if anyone's interested afterwards, I'll have this. You can have a peruse through if you'd like to look through it. Um, and if we get enough people that want to get some, I want to do this tonight, we can order them and have them here by next Thursday if anyone's interested. So we make them available for $80, um, and with each one comes this uh, library, like those people were asking Steve Hill for. From. Uh, it, it, asks, it has about 270 books on it. You can get uh, biographies, you can get journals from men like George Fox, who founded the Quakers, John Wesley, who founded the Methodist societies, um, Jonathan Brainerd, who was the, the intercessor in America, who actually died seeking God so hard he, he got pneumonia. And he, died. he was Jonathan Edwards' uh, nephew. Uh, we've got amazing things. Catherine Booth, Salvation Army, her messages, women, women in ministry, um, all kinds of controversial things that we love. We've got all of the early church fathers on that. If you want to find out what the church father said for the first 500 years, every single one of them uh, that's translated into English, they're all on there, the complete set, plus many, many other useful things to revival. So I just wanted to briefly share about that, and afterwards, if anyone's interested, come see me. We'll have a little sign-up sheet, and uh, we'll see how many we want to order for, for next week. Um, I'll turn it back over to Dad. God bless you guys. Now, when we, uh, when we find out what God has done before, it becomes quite exciting because you realize that this is not something was invented during the Jesus movement. It came a long time before that. And, and some of you have seen miracles that God has done, but I think in our time has arose another generation that knew not the Lord. So uh, i just tell you one little story about this. Uh, a year ago, a 17-year-old girl called Chloe, she's a beautiful little girl that loves God. She spent an awful lot of time in prayer and seeking God. And her parents bought one of these and she was reading through a section. I think it was in either Ruth or Esther. It's one of the lady sections. By the way, girls, you need to know this. Everybody knows God can't use woman except God and you. 
and she's reading a story about a 17-year-old girl like her who was a Salvation Army lassie. And this girl, little slip of a thing, a beautiful little 17-year-old girl standing in front of thousands of miners who are crying and weeping because God touched them. And she's standing looking and she goes, you're miserable. And they go, we're miserable. And they're throwing up and all kinds of stuff. And that little girl's ministry lasted 20 years. She married some great guy in the end. They lived wonderful lives. But she's reading this, and it's about a girl like her. Small, it's only about four, 400 words. So she went on Google and looked up everything she could find. The following day, she went back to her high school, still in high school, and she led 10 of her friends to the Lord that day. Then, by the next week, there were enough kids saved in that school to start a little church right in their high school. And so she went back and she told her parents, she said, I know what I am now. I am a revivalist. So the dad, who was in Kona, Hawaii, decided they'd put on a special school. Uh, they called it a DTS, Discipleship Training School, only this one they called Circuit Riders. The, the Methodists had these people that rode on a circuit. So their idea was to get, if young people were interested in seeing God do something, need to say a quick word to you about revival. We are not seeking revival. It is a description of what happens when God shows up. We are not seeking revival. We are seeking the Lord. And if he shows up, you'll see it. So many people go, I've been praying for revival for a long time and I haven't seen it. You're looking in the wrong direction, like seeking the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. There's tons and tons of definitions of revival. I've looked at a lot of them. Here's my, this is not the biblical definition, but I like it anyway, so I'll give it to you. Revival happens when God gets so sick of being misrepresented by people who say they know him that he shows up in person to kick butt and take names. So the dad thought there might be, you know, somewhere in Hawaii, maybe even somewhere from somewhere else, maybe about 30 kids that might be really interested in seeking God to see something like this happen. Do you know how many came last year? 300 kids. There is a hunger in this nation among the young to see God do something again. They've heard about it. They've read books about it. They want to see it for themselves. So 300, this is a five-week-long thing. But the end of it, it so blew their minds of the hunger from these kids that came from all over the place that this year they ran it again. Instead of a five-week course, because the school holidays now, remember, instead of a five-week course, they did just two weeks. It's intense. They get up at six in the morning. They're working out and stuff, they're there all day, and in those two weeks, started in Orlando, Florida, and kids came from all that direction and some from other parts of the country. I was in one a few weeks ago. When I moved from there, they came to Los Angeles, and there was a YWAM base there, and uh, they arrived there. There were 180 kids that came to that, and it was just like this, except they jammed every place. They were all, there was no place to sit, they jammed out the whole room. And this is what they get up in the morning, in the afternoon, after intense training and stuff, they sent them out to four or five different areas. And when they came back that afternoon, 56 got saved, 72 the next day. Just like that, people are getting saved, healed from young people who have a hunger to see God do something again. From there, they were going either one of two places. There was five different places. One was Colorado Springs, where all the fire is. We want to see another fire, not that one. Yeah. And then to London for two weeks. And the last one will be held sometime near our time now. Um, and that is going to be in Kansas City. And they will probably link up with IHOP at the same time. So I'm just saying this to you because there is a real hunger, especially among the young, to see God do something again. 
Now, I want to ask you a quick question, and I'll give you this. How do you like my world there? I look at it every day from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. The Lord's name is to be praised. So I'm going to ask you this question. I got a bunch of fun things here, but tonight, because this is, I'm going to ask you this question. If I can find it. I've been thinking many years about what the root of one of these awakenings is. What is God looking for when he seems to visit a place? Other people have prayed for things, and yet he comes to some unknown, sometimes almost unheard of place. If you go through history and you look at these places where God showed up, every one of them was sort of very little known. You never would have heard of those places except God showed up there. Israel is a classic example. If you look at a big map of the world and you put a thumbtack where Israel is compared with all the other nations around it, they're huge and Israel, you can put the thumbtack in and it covers the whole country. Then why in the fat is Israel still in the news every single week and has been for thousands of years. What, and what happened to these other nations around? They're still there. But there's something, is it that they had special genes or you know they were genetically superior? No, they were a loser bunch of people. But God loves taking people that everybody writes off and raising them up to do something astonishing. And you know what happens in the end of people go, that can't possibly be you. You are a loser. And your, your answer to that is not to go, oh, I am not a loser. I will show you I am a wonder. Say, yes, but I'm loved by God and he's doing all kinds of cool things. And I'm just going to get a hand on the hem of Jesus' garment and I'm going wherever he's going. Now, here's a question. And it's really simple. This is the opening of what I want to look at with you in these next few days. But there are four sets of scriptures that seem to point to common elements of those who had in Bible history a close walk with God. We've looked at 2,000 years to get this. Here's the four. Number one, they're called friends of God. Two, they have pure hearts. The heart I told you about? It stayed true and good. Three, their prayers seem to get answered. Four, they left a place of honor always for God and his glory. They never tried to seek the glory for themselves. Somebody asked David Wilkerson. David was a friend. He died about a year and a half ago. His wife died just about two weeks ago. I've had a lot of friends that are in the study Bible as contributors that are gone now. Keith Green, we're going to talk about a little bit later, because it's Keith's anniversary of 30 years ago of what God did with that young man. But in looking at those things, I wondered what happens when people who are little and don't have some wonderful thing get suddenly thrust into the limelight? What happens with them? I'm going to give you a little quick thing. Here's what Dave Wilkerson said. It is all right to, to stand in the limelight, if you like, to, uh, to have sort of the glow or the smoke of being awesome in that thing, as long as when you take a breath, you don't take a deep breath. It's quite all right to be happy and excited about God, but you never go, yes. You should have seen what Keith did with poor kids that came up to sign the autograph of his, you know, everybody gets autographs and puts them on their albums or something. 
would you sign my album? And they go, no, that's idolatry. And they go, oh, okay. <laughs> All right, I'll take you through this. Part. By the way, this should be a three-dimensional holographic projection with an avatar color on it. But times are hard in the evangelistic field. And, and we just created this, this screen earlier today. So put up with it, all right? I don't believe anybody can have 15,000 close friends. I don't care if you're good. Like, I want to apologize for my headset mic. Lady Gaga wasn't using it. She was tweeting all the time. She didn't even know it was gone. You, you can't have 15,000 close friends. You can't have 100,000 close friends. You can't even spell that. So, with God, how does he get to call some people his friends? I have some real close friends. I've, I've met a lot of people. Our family has seen an awful lot of people over the years. I have some true friends, some really wonderful friends. You know, a true friend is somebody who will stick with you. I'll put it like this. A true fan, friend is somebody who will stick with you till the day you die. Whatever your background has been, whatever state you die in, when you die, a true friend will still be there by the side of your grave because they loved you from the time they met you to the time you died. You see, God is like that. You meet him. I don't care what your background is. You can be anti-God. You can be God, God lover with 15 generations of ministry before you. You can be different religion, religion faith. When you meet God, the real God, in Jesus Christ, something happens to you that alters everything. It changes the world. Your eyes are different. The day I woke up after getting saved, I looked out the window and the whole world had changed color. Heaven above was soft blue. Earth beneath was sweeter green. Something lives in every hue Christless eyes have never seen. Now, this thing here. Why does God visit places and nations with certain people, I mentioned that are hardly known? Many who seek revival, I mentioned this to you earlier, fail to see revival as only a description of him and not our goal. We are to seek the Lord. You see, this book has what's called God's laws in it. Let me tell you what God's laws are. They're not inventions. They are simply descriptions of reality. I'll say it again. God's laws are not inventions. They are descriptions of reality. Let me give you one. This all the sinneth, it shall die, the Bible says. Let me put another one like this. Yea, verily, if thou jumpest off a 14-story building without a hang glider, without a bat suit, and Batman just came out again a day or so ago, look carefully at that suit and think about it, a Spider-Man, one of those, or even a New Zealand bungee cord. That's when they tie something around you and you jump off a 40-story building and it's got a band on it and it pulls you out just before you hit the water or the cement. Sometimes they make a mistake. They don't bother to bury you. They just paint over where you hit. Yea, verily, if thou jumpest off that 14-story building, Thou shalt accelerate at 32 foot a second a second, and when thou strikest thy head against the cement, thou shalt be paced. Amen. What if you go and see a Peter Pan movie? And then you sing, we can fly, we can fly, we can fly. If you jump out, you will still die. This is called bless your heart. Bless your heart is a southern expression in this nation. It is a nice way of saying, what an idiot. He tripped and broke his foot. Bless his heart. 
Amen. Bless your heart. If you try to break what is true, you won't break God's laws. It'll break you. He describes for you what is real. He knows it's not just inventions, they're real. See? Now, a couple of quick verses. The Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. You, Israel, are my servant Jacob, and the seed of Abraham, my friend. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the seed of Abraham, your friend, forever? Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness, for he was called the friend of God. Now here are two people, Moses and Abraham, that have a special word given to them that they are friends of God. God's Facebook doesn't have 80 billion people. It's got a few. So how do you get in this Facebook? When God makes friends that are recorded in this book for us to know, we could ask an obvious question. How did they get such an incredible honor from him? I mentioned this to you earlier. Notice how many times the Lord speaks about their heart. It is the center of it all. Here's some more verses. Solomon said, You've showed to your servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before you in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with you. And you've kept for him this great kindness that you've given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the Lord said to David, my father, Whereas it was in your heart to build a house to my name, you did well that was in your heart. That's why I'm after your heart to be tuned back to God. That in the heart of your life, the decisions you make from this time on will not be primarily from what you think is right and what you think will, you can get away with. It'll come from what God speaks to you. You can damage this heart so it doesn't tell you the truth. But it's designed to give you the truth about the world. Now, how can we know? In each case, those who are called to be his friends are those who from the heart sought to trust and follow him and whatever he called them to do. This is John Dawson, one of my friends. Kingdom of God, John says, is built on friendships. Do you know what salvation is? We know it's getting saved, it's knowing God. Salvation is to be restored to a place of real friendship with God. When you give your life to Jesus, then he makes you his friend. When he writes down whether you're a friend or not in his book is another story. So how can we know we are his friend? It is possible to lose your heart. Here is a problem. Solomon, who was given that, that we just saw a page or two ago and Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart now guys you need to understand this do not have more than one wife wives wives it's hard enough to have one wife to have more than one wife his heart was not perfect with the Lord as God as was the heart of David his father and he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David. Now, when Jesus had been praying, one of his disciples came to him as he finished and said, Lord, teach us to pray. That thing I talked about earlier, pray, uh, just as John taught his disciples. And this is what we call now the Lord's Prayer. The actual real Lord's Prayer this is when Jesus told them how to pray. It's John 17 when Jesus is talking to his father. But this is good and it's a short one and we've all heard it. Okay? This is how you should pray. Father, may your name be honored. May your kingdom come soon. Give us our food day by day. Forgive us our sins just as we forgive those who have sinned against us and don't let us yield to temptation. Some things add but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
It's just the police coming to arrest me. They tend to do that from time to time. Okay. Jesus says this, Ask, and it shall be given to you. How many have seen this verse before? Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock. i got to go like this. Pretty miserable. Demonic pulpits do that. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it shall be opened. Now I'm going to ask you this question. How many of you have ever asked or sought, and not, as far as you know, that prayer was not answered? Some of you, if I put my hand up, will I go to hell? No. No. Why are you asking that question? For this. Three gates are used in each of these requests for a needed answer. Ask. See your mouth. This is how God makes the world. He speaks and it comes into existence. This is important. The words you say can change other people's lives. You know, if I'm a medical doctor and I analyze you and I find out you have a serious cancer and I tell you this for my authority as a medical doctor, I say, I'm sorry, but what you have, I, we can't fix. It's too widespread. And I'm sorry, but you have a fatal attraction. And if I say to you, and you say, well, what do you mean? Do you mean, how long am I going to last? You go, I tell you, well, maybe six weeks. When I say to you, you have something that is going to kill you in six weeks, your immune system shuts down. It goes, did you hear that, boys? We're going to die. And it just closes the door. Somebody's words can kill you. We'll look at that a little bit later. Not tonight. Eyes. Second thing that God does, if he speaks, he looks at what he's done. And that's the cool thing about God. He loves what he does. He looks and he goes, it's very good. This is how you do it. If you've done something cool, this is what you want to do. You want to go like this. Uh, if, I, if I look at you and say, that, that's saying you're a musician and you're playing. You know? like I said, that's really good. And you go, oh, it's not really that good. Do people want to do that like that's a beautiful dress. Oh, this old rubbish. Well, you know, I got it in a sale. That, that's how we think that's like humility. I'm just being humble. Actually, that's a form of pride. It means this. Say it again. I missed it the first time. Okay. So when it says seek, you've got you to see something. The Bible talks about without vision people perish. And then the ears, knock, knock. It's more than just one. This is not a knock. That's not a knock. This is, that's a knock. See that? If you hear somebody knock on your door like that, you go, what was that? But if they go, boom, 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 somebody's at the door, you know, you get that picture. So God speaks the universe into reality. And he sees his work as good. Now, check this out. In this parable, immediately following that prayer we call the Lord's Prayer, there's a very strange sort of story about a friendship. Remember again, God seeks those who genuinely love and trust him. And what is the point of this strange parable? The story is simple. This man is a baker. He has a friend. He goes to sleep. Well, he's pretty much asleep. He's put his family all up. They've closed the shop a long time ago. And then he's got this friend. And the friend arrives there sometime. I don't know what time. The trouble with friends is they can arrive at 2 in the morning or something. And you're asleep. And his friend, this is what the friend goes. Let's call him Jack. He's the baker. Jack the baker. Jack the baker. Jack the baker. Okay. Jack! 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 
The next thing is a rock. Jack! 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 Window breaks. Door. Jack looks out the window. Who is that? Is that you? Shut up! What are you doing? Well, I'm sorry to call you at this time. But have some friends came. They, they all came from different places and we run out of food, so what we need is just a few loaves of bread. C could you up and, up and give us some bread? No, this is the answer of a friend. No! But I know it's late. I should have actually bought money too. I didn't have that. Sorry about that. But could, could you, could you, this is how you spell N O. No. Broken window closes. Silence for 30 seconds. Jack! Oh, Jack! Think of the donkey in Shrek. Jack, 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 Jack! Here's what the Bible said. Though, no, see this? That's the story. I say to you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend. Yet because of it, now this is the word. Some of you have different versions. I have the King Jimmy version. What was good enough for the Apostle Paul is good enough for me. So I have this version. But you've got all kinds of advanced versions. Some of you have the message as opposed to no message at all. Some of you have the living as opposed to the dead Bible. Some of you have the RSV, reverse stilted vision. You have all different kinds of versions and there's probably three new ones been invented while we're talking. So what is this word, importunity? Very strange word. Because of his M opportunity. Uh, anybody got a Bible here? You know, one of the best things to study the Bible is a Bible. If you actually have one, that is amazing. You can like actually look it up. And some of you are going to find it an exciting thing. If you learn how to read, it will be an amazing thing. Some of you are, well, praise the Lord, I don't need to read. I just, hallelujah, I just, I receive and watch the devil saying things to you that aren't in this one, okay? Make sure you read. Now, what do you have? Anybody here have uh, a name? Has anybody got a Bible? Nobody. You've got one, haven't you? What does your one say? It says, um, because of his shameless persistence. Aha! That is the single best translation I've heard of the word input. What is that? That's a wonderful. Amplified, twinkle, twinkle, sparkle, scintillate, little diminutive miniature, star, nova, how I wonder, cogitate, ruminate. It's good. It's a good version. Because of his, that's the key word, shameless. That guy yelling and throwing things and talking to his friend, and he will not go away until what he came for, he gets. And the reason he gets it is because he has no shame at all. And that is what God wants to do in his church. He wants to take shame out of your life because when Jesus dies on the cross, he doesn't just die for the sin of the world, he dies stripped naked to take your shame as well. And what I'm looking for, this is why I want you drunk and crazy. I don't want anything to stop you from listening and hearing and seeing God do something. And that means he's going to take your shame out of your life if you're not afraid to do something. Did you hear the hip-hop? Did you th hear the songs? Did you hear what was said? No shame. I believe this. 
God hears requests made without shame. He will respond to any legitimate need others may have. I love God to break all the chains. Wouldn't it be good to actually knock? If I said to you, how many would love to see when you knock, the door actually opens? Okay? Then you watch to see what God takes shame away from you. Let me tell you something about your heart again. The greatest problem in the physical body today, Center for Disease Control Atlanta, is stress and depression. Not stress of, oh shoot, I don't have enough money to pay the taxes, or I forgot to study for my test and I've got them tomorrow, not that one. The deep things that you can't touch normally. And over 87% of physical illness is caused by shame and depression and stress that simply puts things in your body that wreck everything. It starts in the heart. Matter of fact, in the last two years, they've shifted it from 87% to 95% plus. So if you haven't caught Ebola, some flying dangerous virus, or genetically been damaged, then if you have a problem in your life, it's caused by stress. And if that stress can be broken in your life, all of these other things go away with it. All right, got to hurry. <laughs> I asked how long could I speak this? Speak as long as you like, but everybody leave 20 minutes ago. Going to do this very fast. When you're bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade you comes, he may say to you, this is the word you want, friend, go up higher then you shall have a worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with you. That's Luke 14, 10. I'm going to take these bits, show you them quick. When you are bidden, nobody comes without an invitation. Every year when they have the academies, somebody always tries to get in without an invitation. And they do all kinds of incredible things. They dress up as this and that. You know. They usually get them, but a lot of times they make a whole um, history of yes, I've been in 10 different Academy Award ceremonies and I've never had a ticket yet. Let me tell this about God's one. You will never get into his kingdom without a ticket. You can't just fake your way into it. You can't pretend your way into it. When he gives you an invitation, when you're bidden, and when he says, friend, then listen, then you can come. Okay? We don't, by the way, God isn't lost. People go, you know, I've been searching for God. He's not lost. He's fine. He knows where he is. When Adam and Eve screwed up in the garden, God didn't say, Adam, Adam, where am I? He knows where he is. We're the one who have the problem. So... <laughs> sit down at the lowest place. Isn't this weird? He calls you, go into this wonderful thing. First you sit down at the lowest place. Humility does not seek to stand up in order to stand out in a crowd. Love, the Bible says, seeks not its own. People I've looked at in history of revivals, those who have experienced visitation from on high have most often encountered it crying. They never expected it to happen with them. They did seek God, they did put things aside, but they never went saying to God, listen, I've done a lot of things for you, so you sure better do something for me. They sat down in the lowest place. And sometimes that lowest place is your face on the ground or a secret place where nobody can see you. Don't covet the center. Don't look for dominion. Do not seek some special superiority. Satan didn't just seek to be like God. He wanted to be God. His primary temptation is to call for you to be like God in an ungodly way. The Lord is the only one with a place of ultimate power and control, and he is the one who neither needs nor seeks to use it over his lost creation. Do you realize this? That if God gave us what we deserve, how many would be here 30 seconds later? If God said, what do you want? He said, give me what I deserve. Would you really pray us, bless your heart? Would you really?
play a play a play. Just give me what I deserve. You. He doesn't give us what we deserve. Isn't that a lovely thing? The soul that sins, it shall die. How many have ever sinned? A few of you? Some of you would like to put your hand up and you think, oh, I'm sure I'll go to hell if I put my hand up. I have people that go, I come from a dysfunctional home. Well, isn't that wonderful? You're part of the human race. I've never met anybody who was wholly not dysfunctional. Some way or another, we've screwed up. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He's the only one with power and control who does not use it on us. It is because of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. Great is his faithfulness. He doesn't refer to you. He refers to his own character. And he doesn't deal with you for what you deserve. He deals with you out of his mercy and his goodness. Ultimate temptation between religious wars to heed the original demonic delusion that if we want to really be like God, we too ought to seek power and control in the place of our call and our gifts. I've seen many works start. They're wonderful. They love God. They love people. But there's something there. It's just a little suggestion comes to them. If you really want to be more like God, you need to seek more power and seek more control, and then you'll be like God. The devil wants what he can't get, power and control. But don't listen to that temptation. It'll be put right there. I can see him talking to Eve. Think, think, Eve, think, think. What did he say? That Think, think, think. Poor Eve. I'm trying to think. Now... When he that bid you comes, how can we be happy as a true Christian? Here's a lovely way to think of yourself. A forgiven child of God. Forgiven, so always gratefully aware of the pit from which we are drawn by his mercy and grace. And a child of God, so we'll never look back, be tempted to return or even remember again what has now gone for good. A forgiven child of God. End. He is coming. The disciples asked Jesus when. He didn't give them a date. The time is not yours, but the Father's, the place for you and the season to shine is never the truly significant thing. Don't think that you could ask God, he'll say at this time and this place because he can change it. The disciples returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven, but don't get excited about that. Be glad about this, that your names are written in heaven. So, he may, see this word may say to you, told you we deserve nothing. What is salvation? Something we don't deserve. What is revival? Something that we don't deserve. What is mercy? Something we don't deserve. Healing, what is that? Something we don't deserve. He may well say to you, what you would love to hear him say, but do not dare assume to ask. Do not presume your obedience entitles you to special privilege. The honor is in his hands, not others or in yours. Did you expect something else or something more because you were given a gift of his grace? That gift is him. To have Jesus is to have everything. Then this lovely word, friend, you're there. You made it inside, you got your invitation, you sit in the lowest place. Friend comes the word, come up higher. He only asked those he called two things. They would listen and learn from what he said. And they would, despite their limits, do what he asked as best they knew how. Here is Peter. They're out in the sea. Terrible storm hits. They're all freaked out. Jesus is somewhere praying on the mountains. And Peter is terrified, this perfect storm thing, and it gets even worse. They know they're going to die, but they look out, and there's this white figure walking across the water, like Ghostbusters coming straight towards them. And, you know, it's one thing to die, but to die when you're attacked by a ghost is even scarier. And Peter's looking like this, and they hear this voice coming across the way, Don't be afraid. 
it is I. And Peter's thinking, I am afraid, and who is I? And he's looking, it looks like Jesus, and even sounds like him, see? And then this is what Peter, this is why I want drunk people. What, what, did somebody just fall down needing baptism right there? Here's what Peter says. If that's really you, you bid me come to you the way you're coming to me. And this is the word he hears. Come. You know, it's one thing. Okay, if that's really you, Jesus, bid me come to you as you come to me. And when he says, come, and this is what happens. If you've got really strong arms, you can put one foot in the water. See? You've got really strong arms. You could actually put two, still hold on. If you're super strong, you can actually put two and then put your other hand out. But it's when you take away the other hand, you find out whether Jesus is God or not. And here's Peter. This is water. This goes down hundreds of feet. The storm hasn't gone, hold on. <laughs> And he's almost there. And then he recalls a lecture he got on the University of Babylon on relative densities. And he thinks, you, you can't do this. <laughs> and then the hand, <laughs> okay. why did you doubt? He designed water. He designed gravity. He designed all those things. So this, this for you, what a cool thing. At least, we think Peter, he screwed up. Did you ever try to walk on the water? Sure he did. He screwed up a lot. But he did all kinds of dumb things because he felt Jesus would like it. Jesus so is certain of his disciples to be in a special place. What is he looking for when he chose them? What did they say or think or have that gave them such privilege and honor. And how is it Peter, James, and John were called up the mountain with him, so wonders no one had ever seen before, and perhaps even more, did you ever think to ask, why not me? Why couldn't I have been there with the other three? Then you shall have worship. Question for you as we finish, to be part of his company, isn't that what you want most? The honor of really being in his family and just being able to enjoy being with him. What if you ask for revival and it goes to somebody else? What if you ask for revival to come to this place and it goes to a town a hundred miles away? You still like him? Are you still his friend? Amen. Or is it like, well, I prayed longer than they did. We deserve a revival right here. Think, think, think. Peter asked Jesus about another disciple. Lord, what will this man do? Jesus says, what is that to you? You follow me. Don't look at somebody else. You do what I say to you. How deeply we may honor a follower's stand. I have met some wonderful, lovely men and women of God in these 50 years of ministry. But trusting God is more than hearing from afar and desire for discipleship at a distance. Best of all, more than just learning from someone is to be welcome in their presence and the signal honor of their friendship. And that's how it ends, in the presence of them that sit at meat with you. There's different levels of Christian life. There's milk and there is meat. As we grow in God, we learn he'll provide what we need at the level from which we may learn. How greatly we may learn from others' respect for their walk with Jesus. Mother Teresa, that wonderful woman who was born in a nation that if you were a Christian, they put you in a barrel and rolled you into the sea to drown you. Why should any of us seek the place of any other when the core is that we love him? And he's put a place in his table for us to be somewhere with him. Wouldn't it be just cool to be thrilled? Some guy wrote to Mother Teresa, 
who was doing these amazing things, uh, her work for the poor and the broken, and the sick and the dying in Calcutta. And he said, how could I do something like what you're doing? And he waited for about two months and that was her reply, find your own Calcutta. Find yours. And comes to loving others, but the God who is love exaggerate. Would he overstay it, how we should treat one another? Does God really want us to esteem others as more important, more significant, even better than ourselves? Friend Francis and Fuso just finished a book called Awakened. Perhaps our willingness to yield to God's spirit in this way will determine if we will ever see a genuine move of God in our lifetime. Final word is a little phrase being used. How many of you have ever thought like this? God, I want you to really use me. You know a lovely lady, she had a marvelous television ministry and she had gone through various battles and struggles and she said to the Lord, Lord, I really want you to use me. Do you know what he said? There are many people, Sheila, who want me to use them. But so very few want to be my friend. I would love to see God get some more close friends in his Facebook. See this phrase? Judges 14.20, Samson's wife was given to his companion whom he had used as his friend. Who gets the bride? Not Samson. He doesn't deserve her. He never married. Who gets the treasure? The one that he had used as his friend. How does this sound for any girl who hoped she would gain his friendship? who Samson had used as his wife. God gives the treasure to someone else who may not have ever asked. He would be used, she would be used, but just wanted to be his friend. Seek his heart, not just his hand. Do not ask to be used and later feel used if things don't go your way. Follow him. Let's close. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the cost of what it took heaven for you to visit us and bring us back to a proper living, loving relationship with the one who made us. We pray for these next few days that there will be small evidences of your visitation that we most of all will seek to be friend of God in Jesus' name. Amen.